Hello, Curran here. This video is about building this tree visualization of world countries with D3 and SVG. This is the tree visualization that we're going to make in this video. It shows the world, major world regions, smaller subregions, and then at the leaf nodes there are countries. And this also has panning and zooming. So you can zoom in to the countries here so you can read the labels. If you're already familiar with D3 data joins in CSS and you're interested in visualizing hierarchical data, then this video is for you. The topics we're going to cover here include constructing a node link tree visualization, adding text labels to the nodes, using the margin convention, tweaking label alignment and size, panning and zooming, and finally using a custom font. I'm going to start by forking this blank canvas example. And I want to show you this example that I made in the past. This is a radial tree visualization of the world countries hierarchy. What I'm going to do is take the data from this and reproduce maybe a simpler version of this. To get at the data, I'm going to access the underlying gist for this block on blocks.org, which is just a, a git repository, really. In here somewhere is the JSON file. There it is. Now if I click on raw, I'm just going to see this full screen, and I'm just going to copy this text. In this fork, which I forgot to rename, I'm just going to rename this real quick to be world countries tree. So I've got that JSON data copied. I'm going to make a new file here, and I'll call it data.json. And over in that file, which is empty now, I'm going to paste that world countries hierarchy. And I want to show you the structure of this data here, because it's sort of the canonical structure that D3 hierarchy expects. All the tree visualizations with D3 expect a data structure sort of like this. The top level object is what's known as the root node, and it's got a data property, which has the ID of the root node, which is world, and then also a children property, which is an array of similarly structured objects, each of which has a data property and a children property. And it's nested like this. So for example, the children of Asia are you know, smaller levels, you know, lower levels of detail, where the data is, for example, Southern Asia, and then that has children of, say, now we're down to the level of individual countries. So that's the tree data structure that we're dealing with for the world countries here. In order to visualize this, first we need to load it in to our program. So over in index.js, let's do that. Let's import JSON from D3, which can load JSON files, and then I'll invoke that JSON and pass in as the first argument the name of the file, namely data.json, and this here returns a promise, so we can say dot then, give it a callback that accepts as input the data, and then in the body of this, as usual, I'm just going to say console.log data to make sure that this worked. Sure enough, here it is. Data, children, data, children, recursively, down to countries. Yeah, children of Southern Asia include Afghanistan, Bangladesh. All right, we've loaded and parsed this JSON data. Now we're in a position to use the D3 hierarchy package, which is also part of the default D3 bundle. Let's take a look at this example on blocks.org to see how everything fits together. Here's Mike Bostock's tidy tree example. Looks beautiful. We need to use D3.tree. This is the tidy tree layout module. Over in our code, we can import tree from D3, but how does this 
fit together with everything else. Let's go back to the example. An instance of d3.tree is constructed and then the size is set on it. I believe we need to do the same to use d3.tree. In our code here, we have width and height. So I can say here, const tree. Well, I don't want to use the name tree because we're already importing that. I'll call it uh, my tree equals, and I'm going to paste that logic from the example tree dot size, and we can pass in height and width. I don't know why it's minus 160, probably some tweak. Let's just use width and height for now and tweak it later as needed. All right, so now that we have this tree layout uh, instantiated, how do we use it? Let's again co consult this example. All right, after the data is loaded, this is where the tree is actually used. See, this part right here is where tree is invoked and it's passed in the root of the hierarchy, which is the return value from Stratify, which I believe is an instance of d3.hierarchy. Let's just research a little bit about Stratify. I don't think we need Stratify. Yeah, it says here, before you can compute a hierarchical layout, you need a root node. If your data is already in a hierarchical format, then you can use d3.hierarchy. Otherwise, you can you know, parse tabular data using d3.stratify. But we already have something in this structure, so we can use d3.hierarchy to construct our root node that we can pass into the tree layout. Armed with that information, we can go back to our program and import hierarchy from D3 as well. And after we've loaded the data, we can construct that root node. I'll say const root equals hierarchy, and we can pass in data to hierarchy. Now we can pass root into my tree, which is a tree layout. You know, I think I kind of prefer that name. I'm going to call this tree layout instead. So down here, we can say, all right, tree layout, and invoke it with root. And I believe this mutates the elements of the hierarchy. Let's take another look at the example. Yeah, from what I gather, see here it invokes tree of root and then accesses the links. And this is the logic that creates the links. And this is the logic that creates the nodes, the circles. And it's accessing the descendants on the root, well, the hierarchy. And then it's accessing d.y and d.x. What this means is that when you invoke tree of root, then x and y are actually set on each of the nodes. And then you can access them for, you know, setting up the node positions and also constructing the links, like right here. Let's start by adding the links. I could copy paste this, but I'm going to type it out just so that, you know, we can understand it step by step. And just to clean up the code first, I'm just going to remove this black rectangle in the background because I don't think we need it. And I'll get rid of this console.log, make it full screen, and we might need some space here. All right, so I remember from the example, we invoke the tree layout and then we call dot links. And this returns an array of objects that we can use for the uh, the linkages between the nodes. I'll make a new variable for this called links. Next, we can embark on building up the DOM structure for these links. So what we're going to have is one path element for each of these links. So we can go about using um, the D3 data join. We can say svg.select all path dot data and we pass in links. 
And from here, we can access the Enter selection by saying dot .enter. And in the Enter selection, we want to append a path for each of our links. And once we've got these paths, we can set the attribute D to be a path string based on each one of our links. And this is where I need to go back to the example and see you know, how this link path is constructed. This is where the logic is for the links. And this is where the D attribute is set. It's using d3.link horizontal. That's kind of interesting. See, link horizontal is an SVG path generator. I think it's in D3 shape. Let me just research a little bit about link horizontal. Yeah, link horizontal is part of D3 shape and it returns a link generator with horizontal tangents. And I'm curious what the default values are for X and Y. So if I scroll down, okay, the default value returns D at index zero, which is not what we want. So we do need to specify X and Y, just like in the example. So back in the example, we construct an instance of link horizontal and then set the x accessor to be a function that just returns, well, this is confusing because it's d.y and d.x are swapped. I think that's because this is a horizontal tree, but we'd like a hor I would like to make a horizontal tree too, so I'm just going to use the same pattern. Back in our code, we can import link horizontal from D3, and that import statement is getting a bit long. And I think what I'll do here is make a new variable. Rather than put it inside of here, I'm going to make it a new variable just so everything is uh, sort of more clear to read. I'm going to say const link path generator equals an instance of link horizontal where the x accessor is a function that takes as input d but returns d dot y because it's a horizontal tree and has a y accessor that takes as input d and returns d dot x. So there's our link path generator and this we can just use as this function here. And ta-da, we get a tree that looks all messed up, but hey, at least we're seeing something here. I think this qualifies as, you know, D3 broken made art. So I'm actually gonna fork this one and I'll just call it art tree. I just wanna keep a record of this. I think it's pretty cool, but I'm gonna go back now to the other one where we'll continue our development. So why does it look like this? Well, it's because we've got these path elements that have the default fill and the default stroke. But um, what we want is no fill, and the default fill is black, apparently. And we want it to have a stroke, and the default stroke is no stroke. So let's use CSS to do this. We can select on our path elements and we can set the fill to be none. Now we don't see anything because there's no stroke. So we can set the stroke to be, let's say, black. There we go. Now this is a, a more correct tree layout here. At this juncture, we could do some experimentation. Like, I think I'll set the height to maybe 960, so it's going to be a square. And let's see what that looks like. Okay, cool. That's pretty much reasonable. I mean, the labels are going to be really tiny, but you can at least tell where the leaf nodes are. And we're getting some interesting moiré patterns here <laughs> with the lines. That's pretty cool. And by the way, if you wanted to make this a vertical tree, you could just use X for X. Whoa, that's a crazy intermediate state. And then Y for Y. But this isn't <laughs> quite right. See that? That's kind of beautiful in itself. 
too. But it's like this because we're using um, link horizontal, but I believe there's also a link vertical. And if we import link vertical and use that, then, then it looks more uh, correct, so to speak. But anyway, what I'm going to go for here is adding labels to these nodes. And I'd like the labels to be oriented like normal words. So I think I'll backtrack here and I'll go back to a horizontal tree. We can use link horizontal again and then flip X and Y back to the way they were. And this is what I'd like to use. And the next step here is to add labels to the nodes so that you can see, all right, this top level here is the whole world. And then you've got different regions here and then subregions and then countries. And by the way, tree from D3 is the tidy tree layout. There's also another layout called cluster that has pretty much the same API. And if you have a tree where there are leaf nodes at different levels, if you use cluster instead of tree, then all the leaf nodes will be placed at the edge. But with this particular data set, all the leaf nodes are at the same level, so it doesn't make any difference. So we'll use tree, the tidy tree algorithm. Our next task is to add text elements as the nodes. And I think for some inspiration here, I'm going to go back to the original example and see how the nodes are done. In this example, here's the logic for the nodes. And each node is actually a group element that contains a circle element and a text element. And it's, it's cool and all, but I'm not really interested in adding the circle. So I'm just going to add text elements to label the nodes. I think the important pieces of logic we need are root.descendants. This method on D3 hierarchies flattens out the tree and just gives you all the nodes. So we can use root.descendants as the data in our data join when we want to make one DOM element for each node of the hierarchy. So this is one piece that we need, root.descendants. And the other piece that we need is that we can access d.x and d.y. Remember, these get set on every node at the time that you invoke the tree layout and pass in the hierarchy. So let's apply that knowledge in our own program now. I'm just going to uh, clean things up a little and uh, buy some space. All right, so after we make our paths, we can make our text elements. So again, we can use the D3 data join, svg.select all text elements dot data. And this is where I'm going to paste that thing I copied, which is root.descendants. That gives us all the nodes of the hierarchy. And then on the enter selection, we want to append text elements. And text elements have x and y attributes, or rather they accept x and y attributes. So I'm going to say .attr x is, and I remember from the example, we can just return d.x, or actually it might be flipped. I think we, we return d.y for x because it's a horizontal tree. And then we can set the y attribute to be a function that returns d.x. Now we should have these text elements in place and we just need to set the text content. And this should be a function that takes as input d1 node and returns d dot, well, I think I need to consult the data. Okay, it's dot id. I think that should work. Let's try that. d dot id. No, that's not working. What's going on here? Let me just do uh, console.log. 
or not d.id, but just d. Let's just console.log d and see what this object looks like. Okay, it's an object that has wrapped our original data elements into dot data dot data. So that's a little unwieldy, but that's what we got to do. We have to say d dot data dot data dot id. That's sort of unfortunate, but that's what we got to do. So for the text, instead of console.log, we can say d.data.data.id. All right, we get country names, or non country names, but node names. See, there's the world, Asia, Europe, Africa, sub regions, and then countries off the screen there. All right, that's how we can add text labels for our nodes. Now we have some tweaking work to do here. Some serious tweaking needs to happen for this to be uh, readable, you know, legible. Maybe the first order of business is to center the text vertically. And I like to consult uh, D3 axes for this problem. I'm going to open up uh, an example that has axes. And see how the y-axis labels are perfectly centered? I'm going to inspect the DOM and see how that's done. Here's the secret sauce for that right here. dy is 0.32em. And I don't know, you know why exactly that is, but this is what d3-axis does. So this is what I'm going to do too. So on our text elements here, I'm going to set another attribute, which is dy. So we have to say dot ettr dy is going to be this string 0.32 em. Now our labels are centered vertically. The next order of business is I'd like to make it so you could read the text, but it's black on black. One cool trick you can do here is um, adding sort of a like a shadow behind the text. I used this trick in this world countries hierarchy example. See that subtle shadow around the text? I'm going to look through the code here just to uh, remember how that's done. Here it is. Text shadow. So we can use this CSS right here to add like a white shadow around the text. Over in our CSS we can select our text elements and apply that trick. All right, that works fairly well. We have this sort of cloudy appearance behind the text. And just to make it a bit more readable, I think I'll change the color of these link lines. You know, they don't need to be so dark, really. Here's one of our path elements. And I'm just going to use the Chrome DevTools color picker to experiment with some colors. And see that? I could just drag this, tweak it to my heart's content. And I think I'll go for that, that teal uh, greenish color of the other example. And I love using the Chrome DevTools for this because it gives you such quick feedback and it lets you really try different colors and get feedback instantaneously. So you can really quickly narrow in on the color that you want. And once you find the color that you want, there's even a utility here to copy it to the clipboard so that you can then go back to your CSS and paste it there. Now that color becomes part of the program. All right, so far so good. Uh, maybe the next order of business is making it so that you can read the labels for the countries, because right now they're off the screen. They're off to the right. Back in our index.js, I think I'll go for the margin convention. So we can say const margin equals top zero, right zero, bottom zero, and left zero. But actually, our problem is on the right, so we can uh, try maybe a value of 50 for the right margin. 
for the margin convention to work, we need to compute inner width as you know width minus margin dot left minus margin dot right, and we also need to compute inner height. And we need to pass those into our tree layout. So I'm going to move the definition of tree layout down here so that we can access inner width and inner height and use those in place of width and height. All right, see that? Now we're starting to see some of those labels appear. But we have not completed the margin convention. To complete the margin convention, we need to use a group element. So I'll say const g equals svg dot append g. And on that group element, we need to set transform attribute to be translate margin dot left margin dot top. And then, of course, we need to append our stuff to that group element instead of the SVG. All right, now we have completed the margin convention. I'm noticing that all the text alignment is to the right of where the X and Y is defined. For example, world. But I think what really would be nicer is if the text were centered with respect to the X and Y position that it has. Then these links would be emanating from the center of the word world rather than the left of that word. We can accomplish this by setting another attribute on our text elements, which is text-anchor. And we can set the value of text anchor to be middle. All right, I like how the center of this is coming together. But now we can't see the word world. But because we have the margin convention working, we can just set the left margin to say 50. There we go, now we can see world but 50 might be even too much, maybe 30. That, that seems fine. But the thing is, I would like the text on the right for the countries to be justified the way it was before, meaning emanating to the right. To do this, we can use, I think it's start instead of middle, but we want to just do this for the leaf nodes. So what we can do is, say, OK, set the text anchor as a function of D. And I believe we can access D.children. So we can say D.children. And we can use the ternary operator. So we can say, OK, if there are children, then use middle. Otherwise, use start. And that might actually fit nicely on one line. Yeah, that's not too bad. So if there are children, meaning if it's not a leaf node, then the text anchor is middle, like the world and the center regions here, which is exactly what we want. But if it is a leaf node, then text anchor of start is used. And the labels on the right emanate to the right of their positions. One of the last things I'd like to do here is make it so that the label for world is huge, and the labels for the countries are tiny, as in, you know, the right size to fit these gaps. And the labels in between are some sort of sizes in between large and small. We can make this happen by setting the font size. So we can say dot ATTR font dash size is a function that takes as input d, one of our nodes. And let's just try d.depth. A value for depth is assigned to every node when you pass it into um, hierarchy, I'm pretty sure. So the root node would have a depth of 0. These nodes here would have a depth of 1. These nodes would have a depth of 2. And the, the leaf nodes would have a depth of 3. So let's try the units of um, EM here. We can, we can just say plus EM to d.depth. And this is sort of the inverse of what we were looking for. So let me try like 5 minus d.depth EM. 
All right, we're getting closer, getting closer. The maximum depth I know is three. So what if I say four minus, how about 3.5 minus that? Getting closer, these labels are still overlapping, but what if we try like 3.2? All right, these labels are reasonably sized relative to the gaps there. Maybe 3.25. All right, this looks reasonably good, but world is cut off now, so I'll just go back and tweak the left margin to be maybe 50 or 75. That looks good. And these labels are actually too small to read, so last but not least, let's add panning and zooming to this. For that, we can import zoom from D3. And then after we define G, we can say svg.call zoom.onZoom, a callback function that in its body sets the transform of G. So we can say g.attr transform event.transform. And I don't think we've imported event from D3 yet, so I'll import event from D3 as well. Now if I try panning and zooming, sure enough it works. Now you can zoom in and read these labels. See that? That's quite nice. Now you can sort of investigate, like, what are the countries in Polynesia, you know? There is a slight problem with this, though, because if you start over, notice how when I first zoom in, we lose the margin transform. So I think we actually need two levels of group elements here. So instead of defining G here, I'm going to say this is zoom G. This is going to be the outer group element. And zoom G is what we apply the zoom transform to. That should work. Now we can declare g to be zoom g dot append g. And now this transform from the margin should not be affected. Let's see if it works. All right, there you go. Pretty smooth. I don't really like how when you hover over the text, you get this um, cursor that makes it feel like, you know, you should be able to edit the text. So we can fix this actually with CSS by on our text saying pointer-events is none. Now when you hover over, it doesn't show that confusing uh, cursor anymore. As a final finishing touch here, I think I'll use a custom font. Using a custom font really makes visualizations pop sometimes. From Google Fonts, I think I'm going to try this one, Playfair Display. So I click on it and then say, select this font. And then all you need to do is just copy this snippet. So back in our index.html, we can just load that CSS and then set the font family. So I'll copy that snippet. Go back to our code and in our CSS, for all the text, I'm going to paste that snippet to set the font family. Now it feels, I don't know, a bit more classy or something. All right, that's all for tree visualization of world countries with D3 and SVG. Thanks for watching. Take care.